It's your show time, time, folks. It's show, show time. It's show time. Live from sunny Southern California, it's the Real Life Trading Full Year in the Making third ever futures class. A tick is a tick is a chart. My name is Karen, and I'm here to help each of you reach the next level in your trading, not just in futures, but in all the markets you trade. Ah, it's good to see some familiar faces. We, we got a few new folks today. Don't worry if you missed the first two classes. Um, you should be able to keep up with us today, but from here on, each class is going to build on the ones before. So if you missed the live presentation, don't worry. Everything's recorded. It's all posted at Real Life Trading on YouTube. But if you do miss a class, please watch the recording before the next class, or you're going to have a really hard time keeping up with us. Um, and you can watch and rewatch as many times as you like for the low, low price of absolutely free. So it's that time again. Put away your credit cards, break out your calculators. You just might want to have one handy tonight. Um, turn off your cell phones, sign out of the social media. Let's get focused on futures. But first, this message from the legal department. Trading is risky. Never risk money you can't afford to never see again. No one clicks your mouse but you. Click responsibly with full knowledge and personal accountability. Each decision to click, click that mouse is yours and yours alone. So let's do a quick review before we move forward. Futures contracts are <laughs> derivative contracts of commodities. They're traded only through an exchange which standardizes the terms and guarantees fulfillment. So the only thing left to negotiate on a futures contract is what? Oh, ding da di da ba da da. Oh, very good, you guys. Absolutely. Price. Unlike options contracts, futures, uh, futures contracts obligate both the buyer and the seller. So can a futures contract be out of the money? Good, very good, Robert, Fred, Mark, Thomas. Oh, you guys are all over it. Uh, very good. Um, futures contracts never expire worthless. If you bought or sold a futures contract, what is the only way to get out of the obligation? Yes, yes, close the position. Okay, here's one that's a little trickier. What is the name of the very important day a position must be closed before to avoid assignment? To avoid assignment. Oh my God, you guys are amazing. Oh, not expiration day. The answer is First notice day, FND, FND, and I suggest closing the position trade three to four days before first notice day, just in case something goes wrong. Maybe there's a broker error, maybe you got a partial fill, but you thought you got a complete fill, or accidentally fat finger reversaled. That way you've got a little breathing room to notice that, oh my God, I'm not flat. And I've got, you've got a chance to fix it before first notice day. Because what happens on first notice day, guys? And yes, I will confirm I'm talking about swing trading. <laughs> first notice day, assignment. They, you, yeah, the stuff. You get assigned stuff and then you're in a world of hurt. Um, no day traders ever want assignment. And frankly, even swing traders don't want assignment. Um, once assignment is made, there is no way you can escape fulfilling the terms of the contract. Once assigned, you are in H-E, double hockey sticks. So what is the first cardinal rule of futures trading? Anybody remember? I'll give you a hint. This is out of left field. Big red letters emblazoned on your brain. Yes. Oh my God, you guys. This is awesome. Okay. Yeah. Know your instrument. The quickest and dumbest way a futures trader can get into trouble 
is to not know the details of the instrument they are trading. Why is it important to know the regular session trading hours of the instrument? Regular session hours. What happens once that closing bell rings? Yes, the margin goes up to the exchange requirements. And what happens if there isn't enough money in that account to meet the exchange's requirements? All right, margin call, broker will close for you and charge you a fee. <laughs> you lose. Okay, what happens if the broker has to close for you too often? Actually, I'll just tell you. They'll revoke your intraday margin privileges and require you to have uh, the exchange requirements for every single trade, even day trades. So, what is the difference between a day trade and a position trade? Oh, stumped you. Yes, the length of time, holding overnight, exactly. Positions not closed at the end of the day. That's, that's probably the, the most perfect answer yet. Yes, day trade closed the same day. Position trade held past the bell. Um, all futures trades begin their life as day trades. Uh, at the end of the day, when the bell rings, if you're still holding, it's a position trade and it stays a position trade until it's closed. Um, with a position trade, until you close it, you have to meet the exchange's requirements. Okay, I'm impressed, you guys. I'm Look how much you know already about futures, and it's just class three. Um, let's move on. Um, whoa, how did I do that? I was not ready to move on. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> position size, crucial in the futures market. Um, the leverage is huge. It makes for amazing profits and disastrous losses. We can't talk about position size without talking about ticks and points first, which is the topic of today's class. But first, just a quick finish these rules off. I mentioned you're going to see this slide a lot. Um, the sooner we get these four things memorized and part of every trade decision, the better. So patience. Patience pays because of the leverage. Traders that chase price in the futures market suffer much more than those that chase stock prices. Patience is essential for consistent success in futures. Um, you've got to wait for the market to come to your entry price. And if you're thinking, oh, my God, I'm missing it. I better get in. Don't. Do not enter that trade. 75% of the time, the market will come back to your entry price and fill you. And that other 25%, you know what? There'll be another trade. There's always another bus. Um, it may not look at like it at the moment, but odds are the market will return. Uh, getting the right entry ensures that your stop is in a place that makes sense. And it allows an honest assessment of the risk to reward and frankly, a much less stressful trade. The right entry lets you place the stop above the high or low of the day and ride the trend to the bell. And you're collecting points instead of ticks. And we're about to get into what those are. Um, it's a lot easier to honor a stop that's in the right place. And it's really hard to honor a stop that's in some wonky place because really the entry didn't make sense because you got in later in the wrong place. And, and so you move the, it, moving stops is disastrous. Uh, traders who move stops might squeak out of a bad trade nine times out of 10 or even 99 out of 100. But in futures, traders that can't leave their stops alone will blow up the account. It's just a matter of time. And trading without any stop at all is just plain crazy. You'll hear about futures traders who say they trade without stops. But frankly, I think it's a mistake. Um, the market can and will do anything at any time. And today was a great example. Out of nowhere, the market just plunged 20 points for no reason that anybody could figure out. Um, and if that happens, and coincidentally, your internet goes down or the broker's servers crash. There's at the very least, there should always be like a, a sky is falling emergency stop. Um, 
an account can be wiped out in a matter of seconds. And because your connection is down, you don't know it's happening. Um, so you don't know to call the broker and get you out. And by then it may be too late. Or even if you automatically call your broker religiously, every time you lose connection, what if the system outage is widespread? Perhaps there's a cyber attack and everyone's lost their connection. And how many calls are going to be heading for those 12 folks sitting at the trade desk? Are you sure you'll get an answer at the trade desk before your account is wiped out? All it takes is a terror attack, a missile launch, a Twitter rumor, algorithms having fun. A stop order is, the safety, is like the safety net for a tightrope walker. You hope it's never needed, but when you do, you are so glad it's there. Um, <laughs> moving your target can be almost as bad as moving your stop. Controlling losses is important to your success, but so is taking your profits at your target. Um, a lot of futures don't make that breakthrough from break-even trader to consistently successful trader because they fail to hold to their target or move the target just a little bit farther right when price is almost there. Um, okay, that's enough of that. Let's do it this time. Um, so, type in the answer, what is the smallest amount a stock's price can move? No, I do not think brokers run stops. Um, what is the smallest amount a stock's price can move, up or down? Very good. Lyrell, Fred, one cent. Yes, one penny. Um, and just for, for the purpose of all our sanities for the rest of this discussion, let's just forget about penny stocks. We're talking about <laughs> stocks of repute. <laughs> uh, one cent. That one cent, that's the tick size. It also just so happens to be the tick value too. Now for clarity, we're gonna separate tick size and tick value and you'll understand why in no time flat. Tick size, size, is the smallest allowable increase or decrease in the bid or ask price. For most stocks, that is one cent, 0 0.01. And here in the US, 0 0.01 is one penny. So let's say we're long one share of IBM and the price, the bid moves up 38 ticks. If we sell our share of IBM, how much money did we make? Yes, very good, 38 cents. When we trade shares of stock in our own currency, we're trading a one-to-one -one ratio. One tick equals one cent. So in stocks, if one tick is valued at one penny, how many ticks in one dollar? Man, you guys, I can't stump you. Yeah, a hundred ticks in one dollar. Well, that one dollar, that's a point. And the value of one point is one dollar. So. If IBM moves up four points, how much money did we make? Yep, yep, oh, you guys are, no, not four cents. We got four dollar, four dollars. Um, four points is four dollars if we're trading IBM. So let's do another one. Um, if IBM moves up 438 ticks, how much money did we make? Good, good, okay. 438 ticks, one tick on a stock is a penny. Yeah, $4.38, wow, all right. So is anybody confused yet? Type in a, I'm law, okay, that's one. Anybody confused? Type in a yes if you're confused. Do, 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 do. Okay, great, let's move forward. All right, you options traders, it's your time to shine again. <laughs> I bet you've noticed that not all options trade in penny increments. Some options like Netflix, the minimum increment or tick size is 0 
or SPX, the tick size is 0.1. In stocks and options, we're still trading a one-to-one -one ratio of tick size to tick value. So what is the value of a 0 0.05 tick on an option contract? Mm, well, let's try again. 0 0.05 on an option contract is worth how much money? What's the value? Yes, yes, Tim, Kenny. Yeah, five cents, five cents. We, it's important to distinguish. Um, okay, so how many ticks in one point if the tick size is 0 0.05? Daniel, excellent. Tim, Fred, okay, awesome. You guys are getting it. What if the tick size is 0 0.04? How many ticks in a point? Awesome. You guys are all over it. So <laughs> we may not have realized it, but really, we've been trading with ticks and points as long as we've been trading. We've just been calling them dollars and cents. Um, and since the ratio is one to one, it's an easy mistake to make. Tick size and tick value were the same thing. One penny is one tick, 100 pennies and a dollar, 100 ticks and a point. The tick size and tick value equate to our currency. And so why do we even have ticks and points? Well, the tick size to tick value ratio wasn't always one-to-one -one in equities. And tick value didn't always equate to our currency either. In the beginning, when the New York Stock Exchange first began, stocks traded in, and this is so hard to say, eighths. <laughs> that meant there were eight ticks in a point, and one point is always one. one. <laughs> it had a value of one dollar. Anybody want to take a stab at the value of one tick? How much is the one tick worth when there's eight ticks in a point? Oh, look at you guys go. Yeah, back then when stocks traded in eights, the value of one tick was 12.5 cents. But apparently that math wasn't tricky enough. So in later years, the tick size was changed to sixteenths. So now there's 16 ticks in one point. Now, one point is still one dollar. What's the new value of one tick? 16 ticks in one point. I've yet to see. 6.25 is correct, but it's cents. So, I mean, looking back at it, it all seems kind of crazy. Thankfully, <laughs> the decimal system came along and saved us all. Um, as a result, tick size, tick value, and currency values in stocks and options became one to one to one ratios. So saying four points and four dollars, if you were talking about stocks and options, was the same thing. And I think that's why a lot of stock and options traders forgot they were trading ticks and points and just began to talk about their trades in dollars and cents. But futures traders never forgot they were trading ticks and points because of the leverage in the futures markets. And um, that means the ratio of the tick size to tick value is never one to one. In fact, you, you can make a pretty good guess how long and what kind of instruments someone trades by which terminology they use. If they're saying ticks and points, they're either a futures trader or they've been trading a very long time. If they're saying dollars and cents, they're probably trading equities and and options. And if they're saying pips, that's Forex, and uh, we're not going to get into that. Treasury futures are traded in ticks. They're, they are in 30 seconds. It's 32 ticks to the point. In the futures market, tick size and tick value are never one to one, meaning the size of the tick does not determine the value of the tick. A 0 0.01 tick can be valued at $5 or in the 30-year treasury bond, that same 0 0.01 tick is valued at $31.25. As in all things futures, you must know your instrument. Two different futures contracts can have the same number of ticks per point, 
but have different tick values, which means different point values, which means how much money you're going to gain or lose when price moves one tick or one point will be a different amount of money depending on which futures you are trading. So what's rule number one? <laughs> this really, I think it's starting to stick. <laughs> Yes, know your instrument. You guys rock. Okay, excellent. Uh, I did warn you about this slide. Um, in a minute, we're going to take a look at the U.S. index futures. Um, but just because we're here, let's see. We've talked about first notice day. Uh, let's see. What happens on first notice day, you guys? You play her <laughs> assignment. Excellent. And uh, assignment for delivery of physical stuff. Um, gold, cows, treasury bills, British pounds, natural gas, wheat, cash or stuff. Very good. Butter and cheese, cash or stuff. Oh, awesome. Okay. So it can be delivered. If it's physical stuff that can be delivered, we want to close our positions three to four days before first notice day. Um, ba -ba -da -ba. All the stock indexes, can you touch the S&P or the NASDAQ? I mean, come on. No, of course not. Is it a physical thing? Cash or stuff? Right. All the stock indexes are settled in cash. And since there is nothing to deliver, there is no first notice of assignment day for the stock indexes. Instead, the index futures and all other cash settled contracts have something called last trading day. Last trading day. Um, <laughs> which is also before expiration. <laughs> How many days before depends on what you're trading. Oh, my God, what a shock. Know your instrument. Um, I highly recommend closing cash settled position trades. Position, right? Those are swings. Two to three days before the last trading day. It's okay to day trade the last trading day. And the difference between a day trade and a futures trade is, well, you guys know this, holding past the bell. Um, Holding past the bell is a dangerous thing. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Holding, uh, trading on last trading day before expiration uh, can lead to some really dramatic moves depending on if the contract's in backwardation or contango. Fred will get into, save that question for later. And especially in the last hour, few hours before the bell on the last trading day. There's no easier way for a winning trade to turn into a loser by holding it to the last second. Um, backwardation and contango are not that important to day traders, although they're really fun words to say. And we don't really have enough knowledge to understand those, term, those terms, but I'll give you like the quickie version. Um, now, there's a couple terms you need to understand before we can even talk about backwardation and contango. The first one is the spot or cash price. And there it is. And that's the price. If you go and buy it now and take immediate delivery, that's what you pay. Futures price is the price you pay today for a delivery of the commodity in the future. We know that. Basis. Woohoo! It's the difference between these two. The difference between the spot buy it now market and the price of the future that we pay today. Um, most of the time, futures price is higher than the spot, the cash price, because of the carrying costs. And we talked about carrying costs a little bit when we talked about the joys of assignment, correct? Um, things like storage, insurance, financing maintenance to keep the commodity in usable condition, right? If you've got 20,000 cows, you've got to feed them, you've got to give them water. Someone's got to pick up a lot of poo. Um, so under normal conditions, the further away the delivery date is, the higher the futures price is 
because the more time the commodity needs to be stored or cared for, the more the carrying costs pile up. That is the market in contango. The further away the delivery date, the higher the futures price, and the futures price higher than the spot or the cash. Um, let's move on. I think that's, yeah, okay. Let's move on. So, backwardation is the opposite. Um, for some reason, usually it's a perception that there isn't enough of whatever the commodity is to supply the spot market. Uh, so the near-term deliveries, the buy it now people are exp experiencing buying pressure and those in need of the commodity bid the price up and the spot price is pushed higher than the futures price despite all those carrying costs. So far so good? <laughs> okay, I'm just going to assume you're all with me. Okay, awesome. Okay, so Contango Futures price is higher than the spot. Backwardation, futures price lower than the spot. Now here's the thing. As time passes, those futures contracts become closer and closer to their delivery dates. And basis, the difference between uh, basis, the difference between the future price and the cash price has to start shrinking because when that delivery date finally arrives, the spot price and the future price of that commodity have to be the same price. Very good, Daniel. Yeah, if they're not the same price, the arbitrageurs immediately take advantage of the discrepancy, buy the cheap one, sell the pricey one until poof, whatever difference is gone. So don't get too excited that, oh, wow, I could take advantage of that. Their computers find those opportunities and close them in microseconds. But here's a very simple theoretical graph of what happens to the two futures curves as expiration draws near. Um, let's say we have a contract that's one year out from expiration. So a market in the normal state of contango Starts here, future price, starts here, future price, higher than the spot, and eventually the two meet at expiration. Backwardation, the opposite thing. Here's your basis, this space in here. That's the difference. Um, backwardation, future price, lower than the spot. Eventually, the two have to meet. The closer the contract is to expiration, the closer the, they should be together. So basis shrinks. Um, now, this is what spread trading's about. No, it's not at all similar. <laughs> um, not at all similar to theta. This is the fact that if you're storing Say, say you have 20,000 cows and you've promised to sell them to somebody six months from now and they've paid you today. What happens is uh, as time goes by, more and more, there's, there's less time left that you've got to feed the cows. So there's less carrying costs. Right, exactly. Oh, who said that? Fred, thank you. Yes, it costs less to store cows for one month than it does for six months. Yes, carrying costs larger because of time. Fred, you should be teaching this class. Okay, now, in both states, basis shrinks as the delivery date nears. And at expiration, spot and futures price are the same. Um, taking advantage of backwardation and contango takes a large account. You have to be able to hold the positions for months. It takes experience because like everything, it's not as simple as this silly little graph makes it look, right? I mean, the, pot, the spot price doesn't say the same like it does, does it? That's in motion too. <laughs> if any of you build up your counts to the point where you're able to do position trades, maybe we'll do a class on spreads. That's when backwardation and contango really come into play. And that's about all the backwardation and contango we're ready for at this point. So that. That's so all I have to say about that. Uh, let's get back to ticks and points. Woohoo! 
and it seems like we might as well use the e-minis to practice with ticks and points. So don't bother taking a screenshot till we get all these little question marks filled in. Um, I've left a few holes in this chart on purpose, although I think you guys are going to fly right through this. Okay, so the first column, this is your instrument description. Uh, this instrument description, the S&P 500 E-mini, NASDAQ, Dow, Russell. This is the ticker symbol. Uh, this is what you type in when you open your chart. It will. It's a little bit different for every broker. Some of them use the at symbol. Some of them use, which, which way does a backslash go? Some of them use a backslash. Sometimes it's a dollar sign. Each broker has their own funky little thing. Um, anyway, E-mini is often called the Spoos, NASDAQ, Dow. Um, all of these now, hallelujah, are traded through CME. You don't have to buy ICE data to uh, trade the Russell anymore. Uh, let's see, second column is ticker symbol. Uh, ba, ba, ba. So now let's take a look at this column here, tick size. Purple, I like purple. Um, <laughs> and let's look at the difference be between tick size and tick value. <clears throat> so on the E-mini, each contract has a tick size of 0.25. That means the the smallest amount price can rise or fall by is going to be 0.25 of one point. And each time it does that, you gain or lose $12.50. Now look at the NASDAQ here. Same tick size. But that tick, only worth 5 bucks. So both the ES and NQ have four ticks to a point, but their tick, the value of the point is going to be different. Uh, now, if you compare those with the Dow and Orange, sorry, I got caught up in the chat. One point is $5. So its smallest tick size is actually a full point, and they're only worth five bucks a contract. You can see why the ES minis are popular. Uh, People like the gains they can get. I can find my cursor. La, la, la. It's here somewhere. Give me a second, guys. I don't know why someone doesn't make the cursor change colors if you're on the same color background. Oh, found it. Okay. Um, it should change color and contrast. So tick size, tick value, and the number of picks, ticks <laughs> to the point depends on what you're trading. I'm not going to show that slide again, but oh my God, know your instrument. Okay, um, so let's figure out what's missing from these little holes. Let's start with the Russell down here and figure this out the, uh, together. So the tick size is 0.1. How many ticks does it take to make one point in the Russell? Ba, ba, ba. You got it. Well done. Yes, 10. 10 ticks make a point. And each tick has a value of. Da, da, da. I'm going to lose the mouse again. Each tick is a point of five, value of $5. Uh, what's the value of one point in the Russell E minis per contract? Oh, awesome. You guys rock. 50 bucks. Uh, anybody lost? Great, let's just knock through the rest of these. I, I think, yeah, looks like you guys are all over it. Um, I don't even know if we need to do these next questions, but so S&P, the ES and the NQ, that's these two right here. Whoa. They both have a 0.25 tick. That means they both have four ticks to a point. Um, so the point value's got to be the same for them both, right? Oh, you guys are like, Rocking it. Okay. You know what? You're all over this. I don't think I need to put you through this whole process. Let me just say that you are right. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Now, I bet some of you were wondering about this column labeled contract months. And some of you probably are not, I'm guessing, from how smart you are. Um, a contract month is the month is the month in which the futures contract expires. Each month represented by a single letter. 
HMUC, that's the quarterly cycle for the indexes. Um, each month is assigned a letter code that tells us the month of expiration. All of the E-minis expire on the March quarterly expiration cycle. So March, June, September, and December. Thankfully, this is like the one thing that doesn't change from product to product. The code for the months is the same for all the instruments. F is always January. X is always November. It doesn't matter what you're trading. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> most brokers, but not all, will automatically roll your charts into the next contract. Um, the ones that don't automatically roll you over, you won't. it will tell you you need to... Um, roll your chart over yourself. So that's kind of a, a hint to when expiration is. When your chart isn't moving, but you know it's trading, that's another good hint uh, that you need to roll over to the next expiration. Um, let's move on. All right, here's some of the other financials. Uh, just, you know, for the fun of it, look at the different tick sizes. I mean, look at this poor Japanese yen. How hammered is that currency? What is that? Ten millionths? Is it trading in ten millionths? Ten million ticks to the buck? Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> that's that's brutal. Um, anyway, the currencies, the bonds trade on the same quarterly expiration cycle as the indexes. Um, so, Treasury bill, can you touch it? Euro, you can touch it. They're settled in physical stuff. These are not cash settled, even though they're currency. So currencies, bonds, deliverable or undeliverable? Do, 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 do. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my God, you guys. I'm so proud of you. Yes, they are deliverable. So do we want to close a currency or bond contract before first notice day or last trading day? Very good. Oh my God. Yes. First notice day of assignment. And, you know, like I've said, at least two or three days before. You never, you know, stupid stuff happens and you don't want to totally be, you know, uh, snapdragoned because of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I've lost that mouse again. Pesky cursor. It's here somewhere. This is the price I pay for having too many monitors. Where is it? Oh, my God. Oh, I bet it's, like, way over here on this other monitor. Yep. <laughs> Found you. All right. Come to me. All right. Sorry about that. So, um, now, this is another reason to call ticks, ticks, and points, points. Um, currency. Because these aren't dollars and cents. You're trading pounds and dollars and yen and, and, and T-bills. These aren't dollars and cents. Um, the value of one yen or one pound is not going to be one dollar, is it? I sure hope not. Um, and let's see, um, what is five hundredths, hundred thousandths of a euro? I mean, look at this tick size. What is that a penny? I don't know. Is it is it five ten thousandths of a penny? Are you just it's a it's ticks. There, there's no currency value that we know for it. Um, and it's, it's so much easier to find out the value when you're using ticks. Each tick in the euro, euro is worth six and a quarter. So how much would 27 ticks be worth, guys? 27 ticks. Each one's worth six and a quarter. You know, it, one, one, somebody can check my math if they want to. I think it's 168.75. But if I asked you how much is 135 ten thousandths of a point worth, things get a little more complicated, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, ticks are our friends. They save us time. They save us trouble. And we've been using them all the time. We just didn't know. So, um, thou shalt know thy instrument. But again, you don't have to memorize this stuff. In fact, I recommend you don't because when volatility expands or contracts, the exchange changes margin requirements. They change tick size. They change 
the point value, but never fear. Contract specifications are easy to look up. Ask your broker, go to the exchange website, or you can always start with something familiar. We've all been here. Um, you just type in the name of the futures contract you're interested in, the words contract specifications, boom, you'll get everything you ever wanted to know and, and more. Oh my God, so much more in, about the instrument you're, you're thinking of trading. Um, each exchange presents the info a little differently, but all the info's there. Same with your broker and other charting sites. Um, I mean, here's a page from a brokerage. I don't even remember who this is. Um, don't bother to memorize it. If it's something you trade often enough, you'll just know. And the exchange does change things from time to time. I've changed the slides for the Russell like twice in the last 12 months. Once the tick value was changed from $10 to five and then Russell was added to the CME group and the ticker symbol changed. Um, all you need to know is how to find the contract specs and review them before you enter a trade. Um, so how are we doing so far? Everyone feeling pretty good about the difference between tick size, tick value, how to look up tick size and tick value. Type in a type in a two if you're confused at all. Really, Ray? Sammy, you guys are confused. <laughs> Suro. Um, all right. Sammy and Ray, let's talk afterwards, okay? And, and I will help you. We'll go through it privately or at the end of class, okay? Um, the rest of you, that's great. I'm Good work. Um, I'm probably just talking too fast for some of you. Um, I'm going to move on because <laughs> as if we didn't have enough ticky things, we are not quite done with our ticky friends. Mm. So, we talked about tick size, the smallest increment the bid or ask can change. We talked about tick value, well, what each tick increase or decrease is worth. We talked about a point size, point is always one, and the point value, what each point increase or decrease is worth. Okay, um, dollar tick, oh boy, that's a market internal. We're going to wait on this one until we get into actually talking about trading the indexes, um, which will be in the round two of classes. Um, it's coming up quick. <laughs> um, but uh, there's one last thing. Ah, oh, here it is down here in red. I'm not going to circle it. It's down at the bottom of red. I got to find this. There we go. There it is. Um, one tick is also one trade. One transaction. Um, you know what? The, before we move forward, let me ask you guys what types of charts you're using now. Or, or you know what? Uh, I'm not, not candles. You know what? This is my bad. Let's do this the easy way. There's a bunch of different chart types. Each one has a purple number on it. Um, type in the number of each of these chart types you use regularly. Time based with volume. Okay. Oh. Okay. We've got a couple advanced traders here. Little. <laughs> Way to go, girl. Okay. Okay. All right. So it looks like. Um, <laughs> Very funny. It looks like most of you are using candlestick charts, time-based with volume. Um, don't worry. Some of these are unfamiliar to you. By the end of these classes, you know what each of these are, when to use them, what they tell you. For now, I just want to see where we're at. So we've got a pretty wide mix of trading levels here, seeing a lot of twos. Okay, um, let's move onward. In charting the word tick, refers to one transaction. Now, that one transaction can be for any number of contracts at that price. This is different from volume. Volume tells us how many contracts. Tick tells us how many trades. Now, we could almost take it one step further. If one tick on a tick chart represents one trade, 
then one tick on a tick chart would also represent one trader. Can I go back one slide for a second? That one? Say when, Justin? Are you happy now? Are you okay? <laughs> so we were at. Um, so if one tick is one tr one transaction, that means really it's just one person's trade. And I said it could be for any number of contracts. It could be one contract. It could be a thousand contracts. It's still one tick on a tick chart because it's one single trade. Um, just kind of stick a pin in that for now. We're going to explore the meaning of one tick equals one trader when we learn to read order flow and discuss market depth. Again, that's in round two. Got to come back for the good stuff. The takeaway is when we're talking about charting, one tick can mean two different things. It can refer to the increments of price movement or it can be a chart setting. And as a chart setting, it can help all you time-based folks get into momentum trades sooner. Tick charts ignore the passage of time. I mean, time is at the bottom of a screen, but it's just there as like a reference. Time has no influence on when one candlestick ends and the next candlestick begins. Um, so since the majority of you are using time-based candlestick charts, let's just take a look at those and talk about the data we get from it and the data we don't get from a candlestick chart. All right, there's a candlestick chart of the ES minis, five minute chart, yeah. Um, so what's, what is this, what's the underlying instrument for the ES mini? Go on, type it in. Yes, S&P 500, excellent. So five minute chart, that means, Every five minute candle is formed by all the trades that occur within one five minute period. So type in a one if you can tell me how many trades are in a five minute candle. Okay, you guys are just too smart. Yeah, there's, you can't do it. It's a trick question. Each one is different. Um, all right, I couldn't get you guys on that one. Let me ask you this. Oh, if I have volume up too. Okay, we'll, we'll get there. Does the size of the candle tell us anything about how many trades took place? If it's a big candle or a small candle? Wow, you guys are good. Okay, so um, no, the candle just tells us how far price moved in that five minutes. Um, okay, but I want to know how many trades are in that five-minute candle. And uh, I see a couple of people. I'm, anyone know why we can't figure out how many candles took place in that five minutes? Well, I mean, you, you've answered it already. The, the information isn't on the chart. Is there anything we can add to this time-based chart to see the number of trades that took place for each candle? Do you guys think I should add the volume? Volume bars to this time-based chart? Okay, let's see that. <laughs> now, Frank, don't be a smarty pants. Um, okay, we've added the volume subgraph and each candle has a different amount of volume shown underneath it. So. If I pick one of these candles, uh, can we tell how many trades took place? Oh, yes. A, a few of you thinking maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's just try it. I picked this candle from 1220 to 1225. Who can type it in if you can tell me how many trades took place? Hover on it, it's got a big purple arrow over it. Over 50,000 trades. Okay. Well, let's think about 
the data used to create these volume bars. The data in a, vo in a volume bar is it really the number of contracts traded in that time period, or is it the number of trades? Exactly. Very good. It is the number of contracts that traded. Um, it doesn't matter if we're talking about equities or futures contracts. Volume bars represent the number of shares or contracts traded. But we still don't know how many trades, do we? Um, let's see. So time-based volume bars, very good, you guys. Give us some volume, valuable information. They tell us how many shares were traded. Um, and, yeah, I think we can all agree that over 50,000 contracts were traded in that five minutes. Um, and we can see that there was some selling because the candle's red. But what we can't see on this chart is the nature of the selling. Um, is it just stops getting hit? Is price, is price probes lower? Is it aggressive selling? Are traders piling on in short entries? Or was it just like one, tr one trade at the very end of the candle that was way down there? So knowing what kind of selling is taking place helps us to judge if the, sell the selling is likely to continue or reverse at support or resistance. And the fact is that with a time-based chart, even if only one trade is made within that five-minute period, it makes a candle. And that trade could be just one trader buying one contract. It could be one trader buying 50,000 contracts. It could be 2,000 traders each buying 25 contracts or 25,000 traders each buying two contracts. So a five-minute candle could represent one trade or 100,000 trades and anything in between. The time volume bar only shows how many contracts changed hands, not how many trades were made, and not how many traders were involved. We have to wait, and <laughs> on top of that, just to add insult to injury, we have to wait five minutes for that candle to close before we can even trust the thing, right? Isn't that what you guys are taught at Real Life Trading? You gotta wait for the candle to close? Well, do you think it might be useful to see, <coughs> pardon me, do you think it might be useful to see how many trades create that five minute candle as it's forming? Maybe seeing those trades could offer us a, confirmation before the candle closes or maybe offer an entry into something we think we missed you guys want to see what i think <laughs> i was hoping you would say that okay let's take a closer look and we'll use that same candle with the purple arrow the one from 12 20 to 12 25 and let's compare it to that exact same period of time but we're going to use a tick chart. Holy moly! What do you think? Is there a lot more information in there than we knew? All That whole chart you see on the right, that's 300. And each candle is formed by 333 ticks, which means 333 transactions. Now, it doesn't tell us how many contracts, how big those transactions were or how small they were. It could have been a million contracts in one trade, could have been one contract per trade. But each one is formed by 333 trades. One trade is one tick. We're not talking about tick size or tick value. So this chart is set to close a candle after 333 trades, and then it starts drawing the next candle until there's another 333 trades. And then it'll start the next candle. There is no time involved in this chart. If the auction bids and bids and ask if the trade's really slow, it might take two or three hours for one of these candles to, to form and move on to the next one. If the auction is moving really fast, they're regular candles. If the auction is moving really fast, there might be five or six of these candles formed every single second. Tick charts are a way for us to see what the floor traders were hearing. Now, 
there's another cool thing about tick charts, and I think it's pretty obvious for to you. Um, how many trade opportunities do you see in that one five minute candle on the left? None. There's there's no opportunity in one five minute candle, is there? Um, it doesn't tell us anything. But look at this tick chart. I mean, do you see trade opportunities in the tick chart? Pretty clear where you would enter, where your stop would go? Yeah? A few, huh? I mean, it, it kind of looks like it's bottoming. Maybe it's about to come back up to, what, 2080, you think? Um, um, I see it too. There's at least two decent short entries. We might be ha in the middle of a long opportunity forming. forming. Opportunities that are invisible on a time-based chart become really obvious on a tick-based chart. Now, let's look at the five-minute chart and that the, we looked at earlier with all the time on it, and that's 333 tick chart next to each other. Okay, that's the same five-minute chart I showed you before. It's quite a difference, isn't there? Um, how many trade opportunities do you see on this five-minute chart over here? Hopefully, I'll find my mouth after I draw on here. But, you know, I'm, yeah, you might have caught, caught it here, shorted it when it broke there, or maybe when it broke here, and your stop would be up here. You know, maybe you would have caught this bounce. I don't know. I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a ton of trade opportunities on um, the five-minute. But then you look over here at this 333, and it's massive. And look how you guys, I know you like your tight stops. I mean, you don't have to be way up above this five-minute candle, do you? Now, um, you're looking at the exact same information. You're just looking at it in two different ways. Uh, five-minute chart, every five minutes, as long as one trade happens, it makes a candle. At the end of five minutes, it starts a new candle. On the tick chart, the candle is finished and a new candle starts every 333 transactions. Now, that's just this tick chart. You can set a tick chart to be any number of ticks you want. You can set it to one tick, although I can't imagine why. You can set it to 10,000 ticks. Like everything in futures, the best settings are gonna change based on what instrument you're trading, how fast the market is trading, and how liquid it is. And tick charts are always going to be affected by how your brokerage supplies data as well. We'll get into that in more detail in the next class. And, of course, the type of market day. In a trending market, these tick charts fly. If it's slow and the market's just bouncing around, doing nothing, you know, from support to resistance, and it's two points between, the tick chart's going to be really slow. Now, I put Jeremy on the spot, <laughs> and I asked him to look at a slightly ver larger version of this exact same five-minute chart and mark the trades he saw and at what point he thought real-life trading rules would be chasing. So let's just take a look at one of those trades. There she is. All right, we have a short entry at 21.30. Right here, I think you guys can read that. I hope it's clear enough. We got to stop at 21.37. And uh, let's see, chasing point. Well, we'll get back to that. Um, but we can use this to practice what we learned about tick size, point size, and value. Let's plan out Jeremy's trade. First things first, how big is the stop? Our entry is... 21.30, our stop is at 21.37. Yes, seven points. Excellent, you guys. Okay, seven points. Now, how much money is seven points in the ES minis? Well, we'll have to look, take a look at the contract specs for that because I don't think everyone's got it memorized, but it looks like a heck of a lot of you do. Um, so seven points at $50 per contract. And... Yes, Catherine, I, I think that work, that way works too if you want to do it by ticks. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, so it comes out to 350. You guys are all over that. Great, let's add it to the trade plan. So our risk value is $350. And uh, let's say we've got it up here. Our R unit, we're going to call it one, uh, $500, I mean. So if we've got a risk of $350, how many contracts can we sell? Yes, exactly, one. Great. Next step, what is our target? We want to get at least a three-to-one risk reward. We're risking seven points. Uh, we don't need the contract specs for this. The risk is seven points. What's three times? Oh, Justin. Man on the fly. Okay, so let's add that to the plan. 21 points is our minimum target. Now, that is a lot to expect all at once out of the ES. Um, but let's just keep exercising our knowledge. Our entry is 21.30. We're going short. What price do we need the ES Mini to reach to get our 21 points of reward? And we don't need the contract specs for this. Oh, Justin, man, is all over it again. It is a lot in a day, Fred, but this was a very special night. Um, all right, 21.30 minus the 12, uh, 21 points target because we're going short, would be 2109. There it is in our play, our plan. So what would be, it was a short, <laughs> okay, never mind. So what would be the value of 21 points if we actually make it to target? What's the value? 21 points. I'll give you the contract specs. Not everybody's all over it. Yep, you guys rock. There it is, $1,050 on one, tr one contract. That's pretty good. And that's, but that's off the five minute chart. Um, all right, good job, you guys. There's our trade plan, Jeremy's trade plan. It's a nice trade if it works. Um, it just so happens this night that I've been showing you the charts from was the 2016. United States presidential election night. So anything was possible. And it just so happens this trade worked out really nicely. Um, but under normal trading conditions, without huge catalysts like the election, 20 point, 21 points is really a lot to expect in a day. And I'll prove it to you. This is a really cool site that um, it's called autochartist.com. They do this for just about any instrument, it tells you what the price movement range is by day of the week. Um, biggest price range is usually on Wednesdays, and the average, that's this dark green bar here, is, uh, I guess it's about 17, uh, between 17 and 18 points on the biggest day of the week. Um, and it shows that it's, it's really more reasonable to expect 10 to 15 points a day. So based on that 10 to 15 point day range, a seven point stop with a 20 point, 21 point target is really not a high probability trade. Fred, it's all about points. Ticks suck, points rock. Uh, a seven point stop with a, it's not a high probability trade. Um, and to maintain a good risk to reward ratio, most days, your ideal stop on the ES mini is going to have to be two to three points, right? Because your average daily move is going to be 10 to 15 points. And you want to maintain that three to one because that maintains positive expectancy for your account over the long term. So again, this was a news-driven night. Under special circumstances, average no longer applies. But just for fun, let's compare that five-minute chart to the 333 tick chart and see if we could have gotten a better entry with a tighter stop. So let's see. Uh, why am I looking at this stop? Oh, well, what do you think? Would the tick chart have offered us a smaller, a smaller uh, stop? Did our stop, if we're entering here, at 21.30, I'm sorry, I'm still learning how this webinar thing works. Does our stop really need to be seven points? I mean, we could have put it up here and been fine, right?
No? You wouldn't have put this. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I mean, and frankly, I think we could have even gotten in sooner. I mean, right here, that's a double top, right? Here's our neckline. We broke that. We could have gotten in around here, put our stop up here or even here. I mean, there's, a, we could have played all night. I mean, look at this sucker. Boom, boom, boom. It just couldn't stop falling. In fact, I think it went, uh, it hit the circuit breaker and stopped trading. Um, so let's see, 2095. Let's look at that now. Uh, as soon as I can find the silly cursor. Okay, here we go. So 2095. At this point, Jeremy said that trade's over. We missed it. What do you think, you guys? Is there still some opportunity there? As you can see, tick charts could could maybe be handy. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm not... So, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I see a lot of patterns here. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, let's, uh, let's see. Let's move on. Okay. We can skip these because you guys are just all over it. I'm going to zoom through this. Just for the heck of it, using the tick chart, getting in at Jeremy's entry um, with the measured move. Uh, let's see. We would have gotten short at 2095 with a stop at 2111.50. It's our measured move. Patterns tend to move the same distance as their size. Toss does have tick charts. So our target would have been 2078. 16.5 points from our entry at 20.95. 20 um, so if we go back to, uh, <coughs> let's just go back to the trade plan. Yeah, these are from Toss. I was trying to do something that was vaguely familiar when I was working with strange uh, new charts. So we've got a 16.5 target on a 2.75 start. Uh, let's go check what that works out to if the trade reaches its full potential. So let's see, 16.5 points, and our stop is... 2.75 points. Have we met our 3 to 1 ratio? What's 3 times 2.75? Yeah, we're there. I think it's about 1 to 6 or something. So <coughs> what do you think? 1 to 6. And we're risking $137.50. Is it worth it to give this trade a try? Yeah? Well, let's just figure out what the value of 16.5 points would be at $50 per point. $825. Very good, Brian. Yeah, on one contract. And uh, because our risk was less, we were able to take three contracts. So... Once, so that $825 times the three contracts we were able to trade without even risking the full R. Whoa, there it is. How you like them apples? Yeah. $2475. We were on a risk of $400. Now that's, um, that's pretty good. So we risked almost a full R. Let's compare the two trades. Okay. So we risked slightly more when we got in with the tick chart, but we made uh, more than double. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> looks good to me. I think the, the tick chart helped us get into a trade we thought we missed. We were able to use a tighter stop, which allowed us to sell more contracts and have a reasonable target 
that's like huge, right? You've got to have a reasonable target. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're just, you're just kidding yourself. You're not going to make money that way. Um, if we were using a tick chart, we could have traded our butts off all night long. I'm, you know, let's look at them side by side again. Okay, so <laughs> by now you're all probably thinking these tick charts could come in handy. <laughs> At least that's my guess. Um, and they're pretty cool. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, they allow us to get better entries, catch missed opportunities, and have tighter stops. But look, um, they're not all lollipops and rainbows. Tick charts can give us a lot more information in the same amount of time, but because it looks because we're seeing so much data, it's really easy to lose track and they can be misleading as well. It's really easy to get caught up in the tick chart and miss the bigger picture. Um, to be consistently successful, it's important. You've got to keep an, an eye on the overall market structure and overall market behavior. In other words, you've got to also keep an eye on the larger charting period as well. Let me show you an excellent example. This is the 333 tick chart again. Um, anybody see a potential pattern inside that yellow rectangle? I don't know, I'm, could be like some kind of double bottom, W, multi-bottom, could be inverse head and shoulder. I mean, you could you know call it whatever you want. It looks like some kind of bottoming pattern, right? And bottoming patterns, are, are those continuation patterns or reversal patterns? <laughs> yeah, reversals. Okay, so if you were looking at this chart all by itself, what, what opinion would you form? Looks like it's going up, right? <laughs> I mean, I see a bottoming pattern of some kind. I would expect price to go up. And my guess is that uh, some aggressive traders might even anticipate that bounce and Put a buy order like down here at uh, down here twenty one twenty four um, with a six or eight tick stop and a target of twenty one thirty right here or even might even target this level here twenty one thirty six um, and that's great risk to reward right I'm one point five points to get four or maybe even twelve anyone disagree with the analysis on this chart. Okay, Catherine, I hear you. Um, you know, I kind of, I could see a neckline here. There it is. I mean, you've got a series of higher highs, too. This could just be a, a pull down and then a pick up. But, but I won't argue with you. Um, so, can anyone give me a reason, aside from Catherine, who's so smart, anyone give me a reason not to take this trade? Okay, I mean, it's, it, it seems like a decent trade, but what are the odds of this trade working? They look pretty good on this chart. We got our subbottoming pattern. Um, so let's look at this, this bottoming pattern in the larger market framework. In fact, I'm not even going to go very big. Um, just remember this yellow rectangle, that's our pattern. And I'm, we're going to compare it to the five-minute chart. I'm going to put them side by side. Here we go. Holy moly. It's one dang candle. It looked like a bottoming pattern on that tick chart. It's just one lonely high-wave candle on the five-minute chart. Does a high-wave candle say prepare a long trade? What does a high-wave candle mean? Yeah, indecision, stay flexible. Exactly, you guys. Possible consolidation. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So is a long trade a good idea here? <laughs> yeah, we don't know. I mean, it could be, but there's, there, there's nothing convincing on the five-minute chart. Um, looking at the trend on the day so far and knowing what we do about the nature of the market, like a trend in motion tends to stay in motion, Assuming there is no new information, what do you think is more likely for the trend to continue downward, 
trade to go sideways or price to reverse? Down, sideways, reverse. Seeing a lot of downs. Down, sideways or down. Trend in motion. Yep, yep, okay. All right, mixed response. <laughs> All right, let's see what happened next. Yeah, there she blows. Looked like a great shade on the tick chart, even, but um, five minute chart said no. Not a big surprise when you look at what? The slightly larger framework. Would a trader with both of these charts open have looked at that tick chart and taken a long trade? No, no way. 333 tick chart next to a five minute chart of a stock you've traded. And you may notice at market open, the tick chart's gonna print a lot of candles really fast. Or, you know, just while well, the five minute candle is still just starting to form. And then during the lunch hour, the tick candles are gonna be really slow, even though you're getting your five minute candles, just like clockwork. Um, at some point after lunch, the tick candles are gonna start printing faster. And check out how fast the tick candles form near the closing bell. Um, you can begin to feel the pulse and the rhythm of the market, kind of sense the ebb and flow of the waves of market activity, and it's awesome. It, it's, it's a really great feeling where you can just sort of, it just sort of moves you. You can tell where, the waves are crusting and where they're building up again. It's an awesome feeling. Enjoy it. But please do not act on it yet. <laughs> I'll say it again. Please do not trade from a tick chart yet. Sure, it looks really easy and simple, but that's because that's how much information you have. The easy and simple part. Um, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Now, if tick charts are new to you, this is probably really exciting and you're eager to give them a go. And it's just very important that tick charts are just one little piece of a much bigger puzzle. Remember we talked about all the all of us having tons of little bits and pieces. We don't have all the pieces yet. Um, but we'll get there. You know, I have <laughs> Really enjoyed our time together. We learned a lot of new stuff tonight, and you guys hung in there like champions, smart as whips. Oh, my God. Look, come back for the next Free Futures class. We're going to get into the mechanics of placing trades and order entry, what kinds of orders there are, the dome ladder. Um, yes, Catherine, we are definitely going further with this. We've got a whole other round of classes coming um, class four is Thursday, and then I'm going to take a well-deserved uh, little break, and then we'll come back, and there'll be at least four more classes where we will go in instrument by instrument. We'll get into uh, a little bit of auction market theory and um, talk about value and, and balance and all kinds of stuff that some of you have heard of and some of you haven't, but like everything, each of us has different little bits and pieces. I use AMP for my broker, and I use Sierra charts with the rhythmic data feed. Um, a futures book that I recommend. What do you need a book for? You got me. I'm live. I'm answering your questions. <laughs> um, Forex uses PIP charts because Forex trades in pips uh <laughs> tick charts are available from any decent broker i use sierra charts and i pay for a rhythmic data feed and there's a very good reason that i've chosen those two that we'll get into in round two uh if if you're not trading futures already and you're looking for a demo account I would suggest wait. The one thing about demo accounts and futures, because the exchanges ch charge fees for the data. Yes, exactly. Exchange fees. Um, they only give you a two-week trial. Um, Thomas, you know, I, I changed the number of ticks. You can change it to any number you want. Like I said, it could be one tick makes a candle. 
It can be, uh, you know, you can choose 500, you can choose 700, you can choose a Fibonacci number. I just sort of, I'll like change the tick until the chart organizes in a way that makes sense to me. Um, it's really about change it until you see some patterns that are familiar. You know, obviously, if it's all wicks and the, it's all over the place, there's there's no point in looking at that tick chart. You want to go, you know, more ticks per candle. Pips are and pips are forex, and it's sort of like ticks, but it's sort of not like ticks. I mean, each pip has a value and. It's um, yeah. I change tick size depending on the market conditions. If it's lunchtime, and I insist on trading something that isn't moving, yeah, I'll. I you can lower the number of ticks per candle, and you'll you'll get more information. I'm I'm not a big believer in that. I do not know if Trading View has tick charts. I don't use Trading View. Is there some guidance on? Study material for Thursday night. Study material for Thursday night. You don't need to study anything. What can you read? Well, I'll tell you what. You really want to get a jump on everybody, Fred? <laughs> uh, you know what? Get uh, anything by Jim Dalton. Jim Dalton, you should... Fred, I think you're ready. You just dive into auction market theory. You can answer all the questions before anybody else uh, in the next round, too. <laughs> Damn, that's funny. Okay. Wow. That's it on the questions? <laughs> Well, all right, you guys. I mean, you you took to that like uh, ducks to water. You're welcome, Brock. Thank you for coming. I do use market. I do not use market profile. I use TPO charts and volume profile. Uh, I build my own. I've got my own footprints built. You're welcome. How long did it take me to trade futures? Well, you can trade futures right now. It's how long does it take you to be profitable regularly? You're welcome, you guys. Yes, successfully. Um, I traded paper for about a year, and uh, I, I was profitable pretty much right away. I've been, <laughs> well, I've been trading since I was a kid. Yes, James F. Dalton, that's the one. Um, you know, buy and hold. Uh, day trading, I guess, I guess it's five or six years now. But, you know, like... Uh, I'm an animal too, and every book, every webinar, believe me, you guys, I have spent so much money on my <laughs> my trading education, it would blow your minds, like a ridiculous amount of money. I'm still deducting it from my taxes. <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome. Well, Linda, we're going to get you there. Pay attention, stick with us. Come back for the uh, for for the next round. I, I I think we can get you there. Three k at a time. You mean three k a day? That's pretty easy once you build your account up enough. <laughs> yes, the point is always one. <laughs> How do you get number of trades in a range bar? Well, we'll get into range bar charts. I you you're gonna have to be a little patient on that one. That that's just miles from here. Now I know there were some people who were a little bit. Uh, bye, Fred. Have fun. Give your kiss, kid, lots of love and support. Um, now there were a couple people who were a little confused at the tick. And good night, Carol. Thank you for coming. It's great to see you. There were a couple of people who were a little confused with tick and point values and size. How are you guys feeling now? Are you awesome, Sammy? I'm glad to hear it. There was one more, and my I'm, I'm so old I can't 
You're welcome. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're good. You know what, guys? I'm, you're welcome, Thomas. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to call it a night. You know, you're welcome, Catherine. Troy, you're welcome. <laughs> Fantasy football. There you go. Another animal. All right. Thanks, Laryl. Take care, you guys. I'll see you next Thursday. Same bad time. Ciao for now.